They've let them go without any prospects. A crazy wife, a delicate child, and no money at all. Some of us men think we should do something for him. But you'll do nothing at all. Fiona, you lack charity. <gasps> I am the mother of two boys. I have standards of decency to defend. And if you're going to stand up for filthy behavior and adultery, then you're a long way from the man I married. I never knew you had such a cruel streak. There's no question of right or wrong and what Mary Dempster did and the reason she offered for doing it. I, 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 I refuse to discuss it anymore. Well, Master Dempster got out of the Baptist parsonage on the Tuesday after his resignation and took his wife and son to a cottage on the road to the school. At midnight, a gang of the lower element of the town with blackened faces beat pans and tooted horns outside the cottage. man changed so much in so short a time. He was gaunt and lonely before, but there'd been fire in his eyes. In two weeks, Amasa Dempster was like a scarecrow. He had a job. George Alcott, who owned the sawmill, offered him a place as a bookkeeper and timekeeper at $12 a week. But it was the come down, the disgrace that broke Dempster. He'd been a parson, which was the work dearest to his heart. Now, he was nothing in his own eyes, and clearly he feared the worst for his wife. She was not seen in the village, and very rarely in the little yard outside the cottage. On Sunday mornings, her arm in his, she went to the Baptist church, and they sat in a back pew, never speaking to anyone as they came and went. She began to look very strange indeed, and if she was not mad before, people said, she was mad now. I sneaked over there one day and peeked in a window. She was sitting on a chair by a table, staring at nothing. Mrs. Dempster? Mrs. Dempster? Why, hello, Dunstable. How nice of you to come. Won't you come in? I'll make some tea. As she rose to move, I saw that she was tied to a long rope so that she could move freely through the house but not get out. I have missed talking to you, Danny. It's been so long since I've seen you. After that, I went two or three times a week, hoping I could do something for her. But it was not long before I found that she was doing much for me. I don't know how to express it, but... She was a wise woman. She seemed to have a breadth of outlook and clarity of vision that was strange and wonderful. She knew she was in disgrace with the world, but didn't feel disgraced. She knew she was jeered at, but felt no humiliation. She lived by a light that arose from within. There's just one thing to remember. Whatever happens, it does no good to be afraid. The autumn of 1914 was remarkable in most places for the outbreak of the war. But for me, another event was even more memorable. My brother Willie had been ill at intervals for four years. This time, he was really very ill. So ill that he had periods of delirium. He'd been in bed for more than two weeks when the Saturday of our fall fair came and brought special problems with it. My parents had to attend, so it was my lot to stay with him that afternoon. From two until three, I sat in Willie's room, reading. But shortly after three o'clock... This will cool your head, Willie. Willie, Willie are you all right? Shall I go for the doctor? Cool. I, 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 I can't 
done it. I... <laughs> Holly? Holly? Oh, God, God. I set out on the run to fetch Mrs. Dempster. Why? I don't know why. It wasn't a matter of reason. I was at the Dempster's cottage in not much more than three minutes, through the living room window and cutting her rope. You've got to come right away. It's Willie. I think he's dead. He stopped breathing. I couldn't hear a heartbeat. I was dragging her through the window with me in a muddle of action that I cannot clearly remember at all. We must have looked an odd pair running through the streets hand in hand. I do remember she hoisted her skirts to run, which was a girlish thing no grown woman would ever have done if she hadn't caught the infection of my emotion. Willie was just as I'd left him, white, cold, and stiff. He clenched his hands like that, and, and, and then he stopped breathing. I'm afraid. Shh. It does no good to be afraid, Dunn. Be quiet now. She knelt by the bed, took Willie's tightly clenched hands in hers, and prayed for some minutes. I couldn't pray and didn't kneel. I gaped and hoped. Amen. Willie? 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 Hello, Willie. Hello, Mrs. Dempster. Oh. I fainted. The passing of time that afternoon was all awry after I came round, for it didn't seem long to me before my mother and father arrived home and with them Dr. McCausland. And then a mass of Dempster appeared. He said not a word, but took his wife's arm in his, as I'd seen him do so often, and led her away. As she went, she paused for an instant to blow a kiss to Willie. It was the first time I'd ever seen anybody do such a thing, and I thought it a gesture of great beauty. To Willie's everlasting credit, he blew a kiss back again. Constable, I'd like a word with you out in the hall. Now then, young man, what do you mean by not sending for the doctor or your father or me at the first sign of danger? What under heaven possessed you to turn to that woman, an insane degenerate, and bring her not only into our house, but to the very bedside of a boy who was dangerously ill? I don't know why I did it, Mother. I just know that it was right. Are you off your head as well? You could have been responsible for that boy's death. Mother, I don't know how to explain this to you. But Willie was dead. He was dead until Mrs. Dempster came. Oh, you have lost your sense. You have. I'll have to ask you to keep your voices down. My patient is going to need some sleep. Oh, oh of course. I'm sorry, Dr. McCosland. Dunstable, I'd like you to tell me exactly what happened before Willie died. Well, first he was hot and feverish. And then he, very suddenly... He got very cold. And then he shook and clenched his hands like this. And then he just stopped breathing. I see. And there was no heartbeat. And he was like that for at least 15 minutes. He was dead. Obviously, he was not dead. If he was dead, I wouldn't have been talking to him a few minutes ago. I think you can safely leave it to me to say when people are dead, Dunny. Mrs. Ramsey, Willie obviously had a strong convulsion. The tight clenching of his hands would have been part of that. But he's over the worst of it and should rest easily now. I'll drop in tomorrow. Don't hesitate to call if you need me before then. There. You've heard it from the doctor's own lips. I hope you're thoroughly ashamed and embarrassed. And now then, I want you to admit that you were wrong like a grown-up lad. I wasn't wrong. What? Willie was dead. You have taken leave of your senses. Are you telling me that you believe that that, that, that that woman performed a miracle? That's exactly what I believe. Don't speak such blasphemy. Dear God, you've caught her madness. 
I forbid you to see that woman again. You can't stop me. I'm not a child anymore. I'll show you whether I can stop you or not. You have a choice, Dunstable Ramsay. That woman or me. To prove my maturity, I made a third choice. I had enough money for a railway ticket. And the next day, I skipped school, went to the county town, and enlisted. I was nearly two years under age, but I was tall and strong and a good liar, and I had no difficulty in being accepted. This changed matters considerably. I, I, I'll go down there myself. I'll tell them your age and get you out. No, Fiona. You'll not disgrace your son by having his mother drag him out of the army. If your son is foolhardy enough to find war romantic, then perhaps he needs to learn otherwise. The news of what I'd done spread rapidly throughout Deptford. What my elders thought I did not know or care. But certainly I gained a great deal in position among my contemporaries. Girls took a new view of me. And to my delighted surprise, Leona Crookshank made it clear that she was mine on loan, so to speak. Percy Boyd's been away at school for over a year now. And he hardly ever writes. So it can't do any harm for us to see each other, can it? In time, my call came. I climbed onto the train, waved from the open window to my almost weeping mother and my father, whose expression I could not interpret, and to a weeping Leona. I'll ride! Johnny! I'll ride! Though I was in the war from early 1915 till late 1917, I never found out much about it until later. I learned to march and drill and shoot and keep myself clean according to army standards, to make a bed and polish my boots and my buttons, and to wrap lengths of dun-colored rag around my legs in the approved way. None of it had any great reality for me, but I learned to do it all and even to do it well. I was a member of the 2nd Canadian Division, and in time we went off on a troop ship to France, to the front. Most of the time I didn't know where I was or what I was doing, except that I was obeying orders and trying not to be killed in any of the variety of horrible ways open to me. Certainly we were often only a few hundred yards from the German lines and could see the enemy in their cooking pot helmets quite clearly. If you were such a fool as to show your head, they might put a bullet through it. We had men detailed for the same ugly work. Somewhere in the week of November the 5th, 1917, at that point in the Third Battle of Ypres, where the Canadians were brought in to attempt to take Passchendaele, we were trying to take a village that was already a ruin. We counted our advance in feet. One of the principal impediments to our advance was a particular German machine gun emplacement. I was one of six who were detailed to make a night raid to see if we could get to the machine guns and knock them out. When the bombardment had stopped for five minutes, we set out, not in a knot, of course, but spaced a few yards apart. We crawled forward, spread-eagled in the mud so as to spread our total weight over as wide an area as possible. It was like swimming in molasses, with the additional misery that it was molasses that stank and had dead men in it. I was making pretty good progress when suddenly everything went wrong. Somebody sent up a flare. It's going to land on us! Run for it! I got to my feet and ran as fast as I could. How long I wallowed in the dark, I don't know. But I became aware of a deafening rattle on my right. I looked for some sort of cover, and suddenly in the burst of light, there it was, right in front of me. An empty concealed in some trash in a curtain of muddy satin. I pushed through it and found myself in the German machine gun nest. I shot all three Germans I found there at point-blank range. Two of them didn't even see me. I'm not proud of it now, and I didn't glory in it at the time. War puts men in situations where these things happen. 
the bombardment was increasing, and I knew that if I stopped there, one of our shells might drop on the position and blow me up. So out I crawled, into the mud below and the shells above, and tried to get my bearings. How long I crawled, I do not know, for I was by this time more frightened and muddled and desperate than ever before. And then... A sudden shock like a blow from a club. And it was a little time before I knew that my left leg was in trouble. I crawled with the increasing realization that my leg was no good for anything and had to be dragged. And the awful awareness that I didn't know where I was going. After a few minutes, I saw some jagged masonry on my right and dragged myself toward it. When at last I reached it, I propped myself up with my back to a stone wall. Done. I can't, can't, go, can't go any further. It was then that one of the things happened that make my life strange. A flare exploded in the sky and began to drop toward me. By its light, I could see that I was lying in all that was left of a church. And there above me, on the opposite wall, in a niche, was a statue of the Virgin and Child. The little Virgin was crowned, stood on a crescent moon, and in the hand that did not hold the child, she carried a scepter from which lilies sprang. What hit me worse than the blow of the shrapnel was that I recognized the Virgin's face. It does no good to be afraid, Dunny. May I... <clears throat> uh, may I have a drink of water? Did you speak? Yes. Uh, may I have a drink, uh, sister? You may have a glass of champagne if there is any. Who are you? Ramsey D, Sergeant, 2nd Canadian Division. Well, Ramsey D, it's marvellous to have you with us. Uh, where is this? You'll find out. Where have you been? Is this a um, base hospital? Goodness, no. How do you feel? Fine. What, what day is this? This is the 2nd of May. I'll get you a drink. The 2nd of May? The last time I'd been conscious of was November. I took a few soundings. It was not easy work. I couldn't move my head very much. I wriggled. And wished I hadn't, for several parts of me protested. In the bed on the left side was an arrangement of wire, like a bee skip, to keep the sheets from touching the stump where my left leg had been. Here's that drink you wanted, Ramsey D. Do you feel like talking? Very. Very sleepy. Here is a gentleman who's very interested in you. This is Dr. Hunin. Can you remember your army number? 74932. Excellent. Excellent. You may go to sleep now. When you were found, all your identification had been burned off. There was some doubt about whether you were dead or merely on the way to it, but you were taken back to the base... Open, please. <laughs> and as you stubbornly did not die, you were moved eventually to a hospital in France. And as you still refused to either live or die, you were shipped to England. We got you in January. By which time, you were a fairly interesting instance in survival against all probabilities. So you came under the special care of our resident miracle worker, Dr. Hunin. You're a very lucky man, Ramsey D. My name is... Dunstable. Dunstable Ramsay. Yes, you told me. I don't know your name. I can't go on calling you nurse. Or, or sister forever, can I? I suppose not. Especially since I'm not a nurse, really. Just a volunteer. Well, then? My name is Diana Marfleet. You may call me Diana. Diana. Now, then. Do you think you could manage the rest of this food yourself, Ramsey D? Sergeant, 
Sergeant Dunstable Ramsey, I salute you. What's that for? Tribute of humble nursing volunteer to Hero of Passchendaele. Oh, get away. Fact. What do you think you've got? I rather hope I've got you. No cheek. <laughs> We've been tracing you, Sergeant Ramsey. Did you know you were officially dead? Dead? Me? You. That's why your VC was awarded posthumously. Get away. Fact. You have the VC for, uh, with the utmost gallantry and disregard of all but duty, clearing out a machine gun nest and thereby ensuring an advance of, I don't know how far, but quite a bit. You were the only one of the six who didn't get back to the line, and one of the men saw you, your unmistakable size, anyway, running right toward the machine gun nest. So it was clear enough, even though they couldn't find your body afterwards. Anyway, you've got it. And Dr. Hunin is making sure it isn't sent home to depress your mother. <laughs> Gentlemen of Ward 4A, may I present Sergeant Dunstable Ramsey, V.C. <laughs> I'm afraid I have some very bad news for you, dummy. Dr. Hunin wrote to your parents to let them know about you some weeks ago. And yes? The letter was answered by a Reverend Boyer. Your brother William was reported killed in action in saint Eloi last September. Willie. And your mother and father both died in the influenza epidemic in March. I'm so terribly sorry, Dunny. <laughs> It much better. Oh, I can't do it. I can't go another step. Very well. Short rest break. We can sit here for a few minutes. You're doing so well, really, darling. I'm doing very badly. <laughs> I've always been clumsy. Nonsense. You're getting the hang of it beautifully. It's just a matter of getting used to it. In no time at all, you'll be walking as well as if that was a real leg. If I do, it'll be entirely due to willpower. Yours. What kind of talk is that from a hero? Oh, please. And you'll have to learn to get used to that as well. How can I get used to it? I don't believe. Then you'll have to learn not to be insulting to those who do believe, won't you? Oh, please don't be cross. I'm sorry. Really, I am. Well, what can you expect from a man who calls a reel of cotton a spool of thread? Or who doesn't know that pants are what's worn underneath trousers? <laughs> I'll tell you what. <laughs> Tomorrow is my day off. You're doing so well with that new leg. Perhaps you might like to try walking as far as my flat. Just a few blocks away. Would you like that? I'd like that very much, Diana. <laughs> At first, there seemed to me something unseemly about the union of my scarred and maimed body with her unblemished beauty. Unseemly or not, it was my first experience of anything of the kind. Diana initiated me most tenderly, for which I shall always be grateful. We became lovers in the fullest sense, and for me the experience was an important step towards the completion of that manhood which had been thrust upon me so one-sidedly in the trenches. But I could not be blind to the fact that she regarded me as her own creation. Ah, uh, well, here she is. She Mail is. call. Uh, Jonesy, two uh, letters for you and two. a parcel that I'm sure is delicious. Uh, okay, right, yeah. Alf, <laughs> I think this is the letter you've been waiting for. Oh, <laughs> and for Sergeant Ramsay, his usual fortnightly epistle. Leola Crookshank's letters embarrassed me. They're so barren of content, so ill-expressed, so... Utterly unlike the Leola, all curls and soft lips and whispers that I remembered. Furthermore, I could no longer remember precisely what pledges I'd made to Leola. Was I engaged to her or was I not? Nor could I get from Leola some indication of what she believed our relationship to be without committing myself. Her flat little letters always ended in the same way. Everybody looks forward to your coming home. And it'll be lovely to see you again. Love? Leola. Sometimes I broke out in a sweat, wondering. And, of course, Diana had been wondering about the letters, too. I was spending Christmas Eve in her flat. Hmm. Oh. 
I suppose if one wants to know something, the best thing to do is to ask straight out. It's the best way to get an answer, yes. Right, who is the girl who's been writing to you every fortnight? Her name is Leola Cruikshank. Leola? Really? <laughs> Are you involved with her? Involved? Hmm. I don't know how to answer that. Are you committed to her? Well, I don't know how to answer that either. It all depends on what you mean by committed, I suppose. Oh, for heaven's sake, Dunny, are you in love with her? That I can answer. No, I'm not. Then are you in love with me after all? Diana, I never know what people mean when they say they're in love with someone. I love you, I really do. And I very much enjoy making love to you. But as for being in love... Dunny, I didn't ask for a treatise on the subject. You're being irritatingly intellectual. There are some things in which feeling is the only guide. If you love me, I ask no more. Oh, I do. I do love you, Diane. And I you. So then, what does the future hold for us? Well, the war's been such a shake-up for me. I have no clear ideas about the future. I don't really know... Where I stand, you see, I, I need time. I see. You don't want to marry me, do you? Well, I think it would be a mistake, Diana. I see. Oh, dear. I wish I knew how to say this better, but... The love you feel for me is all giving, Diana. You've washed me, fed me, and lured me back to this world when I was far away. You've taught me to walk again. And how to face the world with one leg. You've taught me how to love. And in every sense, the man that I am is what you created. I'm deeply, deeply grateful, but the task you set out to do is done. It's finished now. I think we both must realize that that isn't a basis on which to build a future. All right, if we aren't going to be married, that's that. But what are you going to do, Dunny? Surely you aren't going to marry that girl with a name like a hair tonic and go on editing your father's potty little paper, are you? There's more to you than that. Oh, I'm sure there is. But I don't know what it is yet. I need time to find out. I suppose I should go to a university if I can manage it. Hmm? I think what I most want is time to grow up. <laughs> I feel like a piece of meat that's burned on one side and raw on the other the raw side that needs attending to now. You've looked after the burnt side. Thank you, my darling, for all you've done. Hmm. Let me do one more thing for you. Let me rename you. How on earth did you ever get yourself called Dunstable? My mother's maiden name. <laughs> Lots of people in Canada get landed with their mother's maiden name as a Christian name. What's wrong with it? It's hard to say for one thing, and it sounds like a, a cart rumbling over cobblestones for another. You'll never get anywhere in the world named Dumbledum Ramsey. Why don't you change it to Dunstan? St. Dunstan was a marvellous person and very much like you. Mad about learning, terribly stiff and stern and scowly, and, and an absolute wizard at withstanding temptation. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that the devil once came to tempt him in the form of a fascinating woman, and he caught her nose in his goldsmith's tongs and gave it a terrible twist? Like this... Oh, how dare you? I'll you. <laughs> when we finally went to bed, two splendid things had happened. Diana and I were friends instead of lovers, and I had an excellent new name.